Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little, and today I wanted to review one of the hands that I played in the PokerStars Sunday 500 that led me to getting to the chip lead at the final table. As you see, here's a screenshot from when there were nine players left. I'm number one of nine. First place is $70,000, which is a pretty good amount of money. Um, this tournament normally gets a pretty good amount of people, usually between 700 and maybe 1,000 players. This week it had 786, which is a pretty standard field. And this tournament is actually very similar to tournaments that you will play live, like $1,500 buy-in World Series of Poker events or um, $1,500 buy-in Heartland Poker Tour events, stuff like that. And you'll find that a lot of the players are both very good. There are a lot of very good players in the field. But there are also a decent amount of weaker players in the field because this is one of the more prestigious tournaments that takes place each Sunday. You'll find that a lot of recreational players load up the Sunday Million, the Sunday 500, and then another tournament here or there. And for that reason, even though this is a high buy-in event, it's one of the highest buy-ins of the weekend, there is still a lot of money to be won. So today we're going to be going over one of the hands that led to me getting to the final table as the chip leader. Whenever I will be going through the hand history, the entire hand history for you, I will have my full heads up display stats loaded. I'll show you what that looks like real quick. As you can see, all sorts of stuff going on, right? But for today, we'll keep it simple. In this hand, a player raises to 200 at 400 or at 4080. Again, these structures are incredibly slow, very similar to you know, like Heartland Poker Tour events, or even the smaller buy-in World Poker Tour events, where you have a lot of time. You don't have to do anything too crazy. So with pocket eights in this scenario, I'm just going to call, and we will see what develops. We're just trying to make a set at this point, and that's what happens. So small blind, or big blind checks, and the initial raiser bets 400 into the 840 pot. I definitely think that at this point we can call or raise. If I had fives or twos, I would be much more inclined to raise because then it's very easy for someone to have an eight. Um, that being said, I think calling is great with any of these hands. I think a lot of amateur players look at this spot and think you have to raise because you're afraid of getting outdrawn. But quite often, if we do get outdrawn, it's not like we're just going to blast our stack in. Like, let's say the turn is a nine of clubs and my opponent keeps betting. There's no way in the world I'm raising, right? I'm always calling, and I'm always just going to see what happens. And at the same time, if the turn is a blank, my opponent's sitting there now with very little equity going to the river. So I don't mind call. I don't mind calling in the spot. I think raising's okay. But whenever you have the board fairly crippled, meaning that your opponent can't really have anything besides overpairs, I like calling. So I do call both blinds fold, and we see a king turn. Opponent bets again, and. I know we have the heads-up stats hidden, but I did know from the heads-up stats that this guy tended to play a somewhat more straightforward game. So he likely has something when he bets the flop. And for him to continue betting the turn, I thought that he had something pretty decent as well. And I think that something, in quotation marks, is usually going to be an overpair or ace-king, or maybe something like ace-five of clubs, or maybe just a good ace high club draw, like ace four of clubs, ace three, ace three of clubs, etc. He could also have something like king jack of clubs. Uh, so th that's generally going to be his range. And if he does have that range, which I do think is very either pair or draw heavy, I think I want to go ahead and raise the turn. I think calling turns also great, but at this point I have the effect of nuts. And if my opponent wants to put his whole stack in, I am more than happy to let that happen. So I raise and he does call. So when he calls... I now think I am against a draw a ton of the time, and almost always the ace high draw. I could also be against something like queens or jacks or tens that is a little bit stubborn. Or, of course, he could just have pocket kings, which would be a disaster. Or he could have ace king. So river is an ace, which is an interesting card. Go ahead and think about what you would do in the spot when your opponent checks to you. I think that I have two options, and... This actually applies to live poker a lot in that in, a, in the early stages of a lot of these high, higher buy-in local tournaments and tournaments like the Sunday 500, no one really wants to go broke early in the tournament. And for that reason, 
I don't think going all in is a great play. If this was a more of a regular tournament, like just a random $50 tournament online that was nothing special, I would be going all in on this river almost every time. And that's because I don't think anyone is ever folding two pair. I don't think anyone's folding um, maybe even a hand like ace four. I don't think people are going to fold that if I jam the river. And that's because they're going to look at this and think that all of the draws missed, therefore this must be a bluff. Especially if my opponent's sitting there with the ace of clubs in his hand, which I do think should be a lot of his range. So for that reason, I think jamming in a regular tournament or even a like a local $500 tournament that happens every Saturday or something like that would be a very good play. In this exact tournament, though, or in something like a World Series of Poker event, I think you need to bet a little bit smaller because people may make a big fold because no one wants to go broke. So if that's the case, I think I want to bet something like 4800 It's a big bet. It is going to extract a lot of value, and I think we're always going to get called by an ace and by two pair if we bet that size. So I think I actually made an error in this bet. And as I review this hand history, which is 465 hands long, we do go through all the hands that I put a chip in the pot in this entire video. It is um, about, how long is it? I think it's about slightly more than two and a half hours long. So it's a, it's a pretty long video. I make a few mistakes and I think this is one of them. And I am completely brutal on myself. Whenever I'm reviewing my hand histories, I want to play perfectly. And if I see anything that is not perfect, I make a point to note it. So I want to make that really clear. It's not like I'm one of these poker coaches who just goes through and thinks everything I do is great. I actually think some of the stuff I do is a mistake. And this is a mistake. I don't think it's a huge one, but I think it is an error. My opponent calls though, and we're pretty happy until he shows pocket aces. Boo. <laughs> so now we're down to 3,000 chips. And even though I am down to 3,000 chips, the big blind is 80, so we still have a, a pretty good amount of chips to work with. We have around 40 big blinds. So it's not like we're completely out. And I do play reasonably well to get my stack back up, and I eventually make a very deep run. As you can see, I did make the final table as the chip leader. I'm not going to spoil it for what place I took, but... I do well enough. <laughs> uh, if you guys want to get more information about this video, definitely check out everything below this video that I'm that you're watching right now. And I look forward to talking to you in the full review where I do go through every hand that I played in the Sunday 500. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I will talk to you next time.